All right, everybody, we are here, episode four of the Orchestra Podcast with Dr. Anna Edwards. Uh, she is here to talk to us about a couple of different things, uh, but mostly uh, finding your identity as a, a leader in uh, the music community and a little bit of discussion about underrepresented musicians and composers. Dr. Uh, Dr. Edwards. Hey there. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rodal, for uh, inviting me to your fabulous podcast. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as you know, I love music, I love education, and I'm very passionate about leadership and um, encouraging the diversity in music. And so a little bit about my background is that I grew up in Texas and I was a violinist and um, started very late when I was 12 years old, in fact. Um, and my teacher said, oh, Anna, you're never going to catch up with all of the other kids, which I just want to make sure to tell all of you all that there's, it's never too late to start anything. Um, so anyway, I started violin and enjoyed that through high school, went to college, got my degree in music education, and then I got my master's degree in violin performance. And then later on, I got my doctorate in con conducting at the University of Washington. So my adventures through life has taken me through um, Texas into New Mexico and now into the fabulous state of Washington. All right, welcome. Uh, well, based on this wealth of experience that you bring to us, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, maybe what every child needs to hear to realize their potential and find their identity as a musician. We were talking a little bit earlier through email about finding your strengths uh, and maybe somebody who doesn't think that they're fit to be a leader, how might they um, achieve that identity for themselves if it's something that they have the ambition for? One of the things that I find really interesting is that if you think about all of the people you know, each person has different characteristics that you love. And if you think about your friends or your family members, you think about each one of them in different ways. And the way that you look at them, it's not that you like any one of them any more than another one, but each one of them brings a different characteristic in things that you might identify with or enjoy. And so the way that I look with in leadership in this is that if you think about your classes, there are some people who are very gregarious. They love to talk, they love to chat, they are very comfortable getting in front of people. And then there's the other folks that they don't want to be in the front of the class at all. <laughs> and they may be at the big, back of the class, but they're the ones who are can be incredible leaders who lead from the back. You don't have to be a loud and gregarious person. It was funny, I read a book uh, recently called uh, Strengths-Based Strengths, Strengths -based Leadership, and I'm gonna show this book to you right now. Um, and I highly, is it backwards? No, it, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's backwards on my screen. Um, well, it comes so, out just fine. <laughs> so I, the reason why I say this is because I, I read this book and it was a really interesting, um, read on discussing different types of leaderships and they talk about 32 types of leaderships which i think is crazy to remember but there are four basic leadership skills if you think about it you have executing you have influencing you have relationships and strategic and so when you think about the leaders in your classroom you can have all sorts of different types of leaders and you don't want everyone to have the same type of leadership skill because that way you can bring a diverse type of leadership to a classroom and so for example um, when when we think about executing or people who are executors, there are people who are very comfortable with getting in front of a class and they are really, um, they're comfortable with telling people what to do, um, hopefully in a positive manner. And, um, you know, there are people who are really good at organizing, arranging, different types of things like that. So each person has probably some aspect of this leadership skill in them, whether they're a super gregarious person or they're very shy, just different types of leadership qualities. 
So another one is influencing. How many people in the class do you think about that you influence your opinions on? I love this kind of music, or oh my gosh, I'm so excited about my math class, or I'm so excited about learning this viola concerto, or whatever, you know, you're an influencer, so you activate someone's ideas on what they wanna do, um, you encourage them to propel forward in whatever kind of activities that they're doing. So this is like a more egalitarian model. Exactly. Where not one person is expected to do all the leadership because that, that generally doesn't work out so well. But if everybody brings their best set of cards to the table, we can all play a pretty good hand as a group. That's exactly right. And one of the things that I always think about is a diverse population of people really bring the best uh, information forwards because you can get so much great information from a diverse population, you know, of thinkers, you know. And um, there are two more uh, areas in this in this leadership part, which I want to share with you. You know, the other one for me is relationship building. And this is something that I personally find very interesting because this is something that I like to do is um, I'm an empathetic person. I like to work with people. Um, I enjoy working with a large group of uh, different types of personalities, ages, groups, you know, you name it, I love it. And um, so people who have relationship building leadership skills are people who, you know, can empathize with others and who can bring their, uh, you know, a point across. And then the last um, set of tools, you know, or, or group of leadership skills is what they call strategic thinkers. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting, too, because, again, everybody has some sort of strategic thinking skills. Um, you know, whether there's someone who is very analytical and who can put together problems together. We were, you and I were talking just a minute ago about how you were helping people on the computer, right? <laughs> so um, my, my forte is not analytical skills, so to speak. But the thing that I am good about is ideal, I, I, um, thinking ahead, you know, being a futuristic uh, thinker. Um, you know, I, I want to learn things. So it doesn't have to necessarily be specific um, uh, sets of tools. You know, it can be other types of things that you can bring into this strategic thinking type of thing. So uh, if you're interested in learning and you want to share those ideas with these, well, that, that's a really specific strategic thing that you can do. So anyway, these different ways of leadership styles I'm interested in because we all have something pretty much from every single one of these four larger categories. And when we find and identify what these <laughs> ideas are or these skills that we have are, then we can really um, find these skills and, and uh, propel them forward and uh, with the way that we do them well. So if you have a, a particular strength, that's something that you can really hone in on and develop to even go at a higher uh, level of that skill. So anyway, I, I find that the leadership skills that we bring uh, in a classroom or as a teacher or um, in, in groups are things that are important for us to do, especially in a, a group ensemble, as such as an orchestra. Because everyone is not going to be the leader, you know, the conductor, right? Because that's your job. And you're going to be that type of leader for that ensemble. But just because you're the one in the middle on the podium doesn't mean the person who is on the back stand of the first violins can't be an extraordinary, extraordinary leader from where they're sitting. Well, and it occurs to me all the time in class, uh, if you're that person in the back who thinks you don't have any leadership skills, you don't have any power in the class. Imagine how much the success of the ensemble depends on the everyone's collective leadership skills cooperating with the stereotypical leader. Uh, because that, that one person can't make everybody conform to whatever paradigm is happening in that moment. It takes everyone's cooperation to make a rehearsal work. That one person isn't the executor of everything that's happening. That's absolutely right. And, you know, again, uh, 
I, I missed a little bit of that because you you cut out on the the screen, but I think that I understand what you said. Um, each person is able to to bring a little bit of their leadership. You know, again, there's the one in the main leader, the conductor in the middle. But if you're in the middle of the section or if you're in the end of the section, if you know and you are aware of things that can be done better or something that can be more positive. So you can think about attitudes, you can think about intonation, you can think about bowing skills. Are we following our uh, second violinist uh, principal bowing person? You know, are we following their bowings? And um, so people who are in the middle can be leaders maybe on not such a uh, an out there, uh, you know, being, being for, uh, I'm not saying the right word, but you know, being really um, noisy about their leadership, <laughs> but they can they can do it in a quiet manner by encouraging their their stand partners and and the folks who are around them. So not everybody has to take up the mantle of this extroverted, sort of more egotistical, stereotypical definition of leadership that many of us shy away from. Absolutely, and you know, again, one of the things that I think about is, for example. When I learned how to play the violin when I was in sixth grade, when I was 12, the person who taught me how to play the violin was the last chair violinist in the, in the little orchestra that I played in because she was the person who um, I was able to sit with. I borrowed my teacher's violin and I sat in the back of the orchestra and she taught me how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And so that person, has been a huge influence on my entire life. And um, she was about the shyest person you can imagine. Well, and part of this podcast isn't just for students, it's also for teachers. Oh, and well. So for the yeah. teachers watching, it's really important that you don't just, you know, play test everybody and just sit people one, two, three, four in the front row and just keep going until you get to the back. It's really important that we put some of those natural leaders in the back so that uh, Dr. Edwards, when she's 12 years old, has that person who is a strong and passionate leader and maybe has that specific leadership skill that they're compassionate and empathetic towards somebody who has ambition but maybe doesn't have all of the ability yet. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, when I taught at Roosevelt for years, the way that I would teach is, um, or how I sat my kids usually was, I would have the first chair and the last chair sit together for most of the rehearsals. Mm. And so I would typically go, uh, first stand would be the first um, violinist. The second stand, the second chair person typically was the last stand. And I would usually go backwards from there. Um, you know, so we would mix and match. The kids didn't necessarily like it all the time, but at the <laughs> end of the, um, when, we were, when we would perform, the, the elevation of musical performance was just so much higher, I think, than if you, if you put all your best ones in the front and you're not really paying attention to uh, everyone equally throughout the sections. Well, and it, it, if a teacher is thinking about this like a choir or a choir teacher might, you need an even distribution of sound as well. If you have all of the extroverted players, uh, to use a, a more tactful word, in the front, and then everybody else is just scattered to, to the back, you're going to have a really weird sounding group. But if you have this perimeter of support around the whole outside of the orchestra, kind of no matter where anybody sits in the middle, you're going to hear a pretty homogenous sound. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you so much for that discussion on leadership. Well, can we see that book one more time for anybody yeah. that wants to check it out? Um, and one of the things that I think is interesting about this book, especially for the teachers, is in the back there is a uh, um, do the test on here that mm -hmm. tells you what your leadership uh, skills are. And I have to say, it was really interesting, um, the, Im the information that you get from that, and then you go, oh my gosh, that makes total sense. And then if, again, once you know what those leadership skills that you are um, good at, mm -hmm. you can really develop them. And one of the things that I like about this book is that it doesn't 
require, they really, in, they encourage you to think about the positive leadership skills rather than always working on the leadership skills that you are not very good at. Well, Which and they, I they might inform what you're, you're not focusing on. I went through once with my students and we all took the Myers-Briggs personality test. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that I'm an INTJ, which is kind of like the mastermind personality type in that uh, format. And so maybe I need to think about when am I being a little too controlling or micromanaging with, within a leadership role? When do I need to listen to other people and see what they have to say? Mm -hmm. Because maybe I have the schema in my head where I've worked it out and I know how it's supposed to go. And so I, I, I need to move forward with my plan, but that ignores all of the excellent uh, leadership traits that uh, the, the more passive, more introverted leaders can bring to the table. Right, and again, one of the things I like about this book is that they talk about um, leadership structure and how really a, a class, whether you're, it's your teaching class or it's an orchestra or whatever, you want to surround yourself with leaders. You do not want to be the only leader in the room. You want to have those, uh, those leaders who are in the back and the middle and the front of the sections. You want them everywhere. And you want different types. You want the empathic leaders. You want the structural leaders. You want the people who are gonna get things done and make sure the room is set up or you know, however. So uh, it, is it, an, it is very important to have a diversified set of leaders in a room. It, that, that's when I think it works the best. Now, as we kind of transition the conversation forward, let's say I'm somebody who doesn't see my identity as uh, the kind of leaders that I see in the media or in my community. How do I accept that I have powerful leadership uh, skills and, and take up that mantle when the whole world is telling me that I don't look like what a leader looks like or um, I don't come from a community that leaders normally come from? That's such a great question. I love that. Um, because first of all, you know, it's funny because when I went back to college uh, to get my doctorate in conducting, at that time there were so few women conductors and it was really hard for me to find an inspiration or a uh, person mentor you know that was someone who looked like me and um, this has been something that I've been very passionate on uh, over the last 10 years and um, you know I think that when I first started doing conducting it was funny because when I was being taught I was being kind of taught the way that all of the other people who had typically been male, uh, were taught. And it was very uncomfortable for me, um, first of all, the way that I was supposed to talk with other people. The second thing was the way that I was supposed to present myself in front of other people. And the third thing was, is the way that I was supposed to move my body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these may seem like silly things, but, you know, they were huge for me. And when I first started doing the uh, lessons and the classes and the workshops with people who were telling me how to do this, I was really failing at what I was doing. And so um, after several conversations, and when I started uh, working on my dissertation, which was gender and the symphonic conductor, um, I talked with women who were, uh, you know, across the country uh, who were conductors, who I did not know, but, you know, I, I've gotten to know them actually pretty well over the years. And um, one of the things that I found is that you have to be really comfortable in your own skin. And that means that you have to be comfortable with your personality. You have to be comfortable with the way that you look, the way you dress, the way that you uh, talk to people. Um, you have to be comfortable with the fact that, for me, I'll just say this, I think about all the conductors and, that I know, and I know so many people who are super uh, intelligent, academic, and very charming and funny, and I am none of those. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, those are not words that I identify with myself. But, you know, I am who I am. You know, I feel like I'm a reasonably nice person. I am not very good with words. Um, I get tongue tied all the time. But, you know, but that's something that I have learned how to pay attention to 
and to try and address. Now, I'm still not great about it, but you know, it's something that I work on. I try to be myself in front of people. I try not to, to bring on some kind of, uh, you know, maestro, whatever, you know, that people think about with conductors, you know, the kind of the maestro uh, ideal. And, um, and I think that it's worked for me, you know, on a, on a general level. Well, and I feel that I was absolutely spoiled as a child with all of the examples that I grew up with in, in the early 90s. Uh, one of my greatest conducting and music mentors ever, uh, Paul Elia Cobbs, he was the greatest conductor that I knew in the world as an African-American man, and I had no uh, intuition that that was abnormal. And the governor for most of my childhood was an Asian-American, and all of my teachers were women. My violin teacher was a woman. I thought my mom was great. She's a woman. Uh, so I, I wasn't quite raised with the same stereotypes. Even implicit bias is absolutely still a thing. Um, but I, I worry for kids in other areas that are maybe sort of a diversity desert uh, that don't have examples inherently to look up to. So let's say that I live in West Virginia and everybody in leadership role is a, an adult white male, how can I go out there and find examples of people who are not that stereotype uh, doing excellent things in music? Where might I start? Well, you can start on my website, actually. <laughs> um, I say that, uh, you know, a little bit because the last 10 years, I've been very interested in diversity in music and especially on the concert stage. And I started an ensemble called the Seattle Collaborative Orchestra. And I also am the music director for an ensemble called the Saratoga Orchestra. And with both ensembles, I, I try to do the same type of programming. Uh, for each ensemble, which is, you know, we usually will do a mainstream large concert, but we always perform a composition by a female and uh, almost always uh, a composition by a person of color, a composition, yeah, a, a, a person of color. And so um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is trying to find both historical uh, people of color and women composers, and also find uh, composers now of today who I that really resonate with my musical aesthetic. And so, what I have been doing is um, trying to put together a database of music uh, of of the composers. Um, of how difficult their music is and you know whether it's it's a you you would be able to do it with high school college community orchestra or professional ensemble and um and try to give as much as many links to the composers websites as i possibly can so that's something that uh i would suggest uh is is check that out there are several really great databases on uh you know, the computer that you can Google. And um, those are also on my website that you can go to. There's a really excellent uh, database called the Composer Diversity uh, Database. I may be saying that wrong, but um, I can give that to you later on okay. to make sure. Well, great. So I have a couple of videos pulled up here that you've sent me earlier. Uh, can we just kind of talk through who these composers are and what their place is in uh, the standard repertoire and uh, perhaps how we might better serve our audiences by including these underserved composers and musicians? Absolutely. Who would you like to start with? Uh, well, I've got uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor here first, and we have his Hiawatha Overture, which I'm giggling at because the elementary school that I went to over in Othello, Washington, which is a tiny little town, and it's the last stop for gas before you get to Pullman, if anybody out there knows where it is. The elementary school I went to was Hiawatha Elementary, and this is the Hiawatha Overture.
Now, if I'm doing some music analysis here, and, and I'm a nerd, so I am, this sounds like a, a very um, structured and expected ex exposition in a sonata allegro form. If I was just to hear it and you asked me to guess who it is, maybe I'd guess Schumann or maybe very early Brahms. Uh, I'd have no indication that this was uh, not from the standard repertoire. Right. You know, I, I think that uh, Samuel Coolridge Taylor, Taylor was a really interesting guy. He was very, very, very talented, a uh, terrific violinist. He was a protege of uh, Edward Elgar and lived in Britain. And he was the first, uh, you know, really major classical composer who was uh, black at that time. And he was at the, you know, the end of the Romantic period. Um, and uh, you know, his music I, I find really pleasant, really beautiful. He was uh, very well educated. His parents, uh, um, I believe his dad came over from, uh, I can't remember which African country exactly that he came from, but uh, he came over and was an immigrant and then uh, lived with his mom for his upbringing. And uh, he was just a terrific musician and a marvelous composer. I love his, his, all of the pieces that I've listened to, they're really terrific. And his, his violin concerto isn't so bad either. I, I love, love the violin concerto, yeah. And you know, during the t his time, he was considered to be the, the black mauler. And um, his music, I think, is very interesting, very luscious. Um, great textures throughout the music. Uh, his orchestration is quite good. Uh, one of my orchestras played, or the Seattle Collaborative Orchestra played the Ballade, and it's a it's a really great piece. I, I enjoy it tremendously. I think I have the Ballade here. We can listen to a couple seconds. All right. <laughs> So bizarre how it's a perfect blend between Mahler and Elgar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just think he's terrific. And, you know, I think he was a very prolific composer. And um, he died very young. I, I believe he died uh, in his, I don't know, late 30s some, somewhere and um, middle to late 30s. And I, I believe of pneumonia. And um, he, he was just such a genius, I think. And it really bothers me that I never knew who he was, you know, before the last, you know, maybe year and a half. The, one of the questions that's coming to mind here is uh, I'm trying to do better as a teacher to pick more diverse repertoire. A lot of these composers, like Samuel Coleridge Taylor, um, their music is not very easy to find or acquire. Mm -hmm. but how do we overcome that hurdle as an artistic community? How do we start that fight? Well, again, I'm going to, I'm saying it is, it's hard. And um, one of the, the things that I'm trying to do, and also Rob, uh, Rob Deemer, who has the diversity website that I was talking about that I'll give you later on, um, we're trying to make sure that the information is more accessible because it is very challenging to find that who is the publisher, how much is it going to cost, and you know, for much of this music, you're not able to get it in, in, except for through rental purposes. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of uh, public school teachers, that's tricky. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking immediately of uh, like Imogen Holst mm -hmm. or even Fanny Mendelssohn, who has been long gone for many many years, and much of her music is is still really difficult to access when there's no good reason that it couldn't just be on IMSLP, like much of her brother's work. Right. Well, at least the orchestral music of uh, Fanny Mendelssohn, for example, her overture, Joanne Folletta edited it. And so that's the reason why you can't really just get it off of IMSLP. Um, and some of these, these compositions, that's exactly what has happened, is that they were only handwritten. 
So someone had to go through and edit and publish them. And that is the reason why a lot of them have gone through publishing houses and are not in the public forum. So that person that went through the effort to digitize or, or make that music available, they obviously need to be compensated for their time and efforts. That's and yeah. Perhaps because the stuff was laying dormant for so long, mm -hmm. it was never put, like a score never made into parts. And so that work just hasn't been done yet. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, maybe this is a totally off topic question, but if I'm somebody who is interested in this kind of research, where might I start to have a conversation about maybe taking that kind of career path and what kind of things does a music researcher do? Wow, that's a terrific question. So, but I'll tell you one thing that I do know. I, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask about it, but one of the things that I did when I started getting interested in this whole business was I contacted the librarian at the Philadelphia Free Library. And one of the interesting things is, is that some of these libraries have the original compositions. And, um, you know, if you were a college student and you were working on a doctoral dissertation or something and you wanted to be able to get this music and potentially write it out, that would be a great way to do it. And, um, you know, using the librarians at some of these um, uh, libraries to help find the, the music. So there are so, for example, uh, New York Library, there are rooms with boxes full of music for a ton of composers that nobody has ever heard and probably won't until someone goes through those boxes, takes the music out and puts it on, a, uh, you know, on, on a computer and digitizes it. Well, and therein lies a huge problem for graduate students all the time to try and find a topic where they're breaking new ground, breaking new earth, uh, to present something and def defend a dissertation that is meaningful, where something new is actually discovered. Mm -hmm. I mean, plenty of people have done research on Beethoven or right. one piano sonata that everybody seems to like, or uh, speculations about Tchaikovsky's love life. There's not a lot of new information to be found here, but there's a ton of dormant sheet music laying around, in particular that music written by women or uh, people of color uh, that audiences deserve to hear. I completely agree. And just one anecdotal story on that. Um, I recently talked with this gal who was with the Ladies Musical Club here in Seattle. And we talked about a, uh, a composer. And when I started looking into it more, I found out that this composer had actually, her, her first orchestral composition was uh, performed with the New York Philharmonic. And um, yeah, and, and, and it has yet to be uh, written, you know, digitized. And the music is in a box somewhere in New York. And so, you know, I think in every community, there's probably tons of music that somebody may have been a really excellent music scholar in the early 1900s or the 1950s and uh, mid middle 1900s and they have all this great music and it's somewhere you know that that uh, someone can get to. Well that's that's just excellent. I, that's a really fascinating field for me that I think has a lot left to be discovered whereas we were talking about other you know Beethoven, research on Beethoven is pretty much used up at this point. I bet there's still a few manuscripts floating around, uh, but there's not anything groundbreaking. There's, right. not, you know, an undiscovered Beethoven symphony, but there's a composer whose entire um, catalog of works is just sitting in a box waiting for you to discover. Maybe even the next Beethoven, and we just didn't even know who this person was. Yeah. So uh, the next recording I have here is... Is this still the, it's a piano trio you sent me. Is this still Samuel Coleridge Taylor? Yes. I just wanted to send some chamber music. He wrote quite a bit of chamber Okay. Lovely. And okay. I just want to give some different examples. Well, let's uh, move the discussion forward here. Uh, I'll put all the links in the description for people to listen to this music. Uh, now I have a mythology symphony. 
what's the story behind this piece? So the Mythology Symphony is by Stacy Garrup, and um, Stacy is a really fantastic composer. Uh, I love her music. She is, um, I think this morning, uh, I wrote a Facebook post on her, and I think I called her an an oral explosion or something, <laughs> I can't remember. But her music is very intense and it's just, it's uh, surrounding. You, you listen to her music and it's just gorgeous. Um, the mythology symphony goes through, you know, of course the different myths and uh, uh, and the way that she, she writes her music captures these stories. I, I just love the way that she captures the stories. Uh, you know, she uh, lives in Chicago and um, ha has written a ton of music. Uh, great orchestral music, uh, great chamber music, uh, choral, opera, everything. She's just a, an, an outstanding uh, composer. And again, with, with Stacy's music, uh, the thing that I love about it is it's so visual. <laughs> You know, it's it's an, a visual experience through music. I just love it. Well, as I was going through these videos and trying to pick out um, little tidbits that, that might do well in this video, I'm listening to, um, is it Stacy? I'm listening uh -huh. to Stacy's music, and the first idea that popped in my head is, this kind of sounds like a mix between uh, the two wind ensemble composers, John Mackey, and the recently deceased uh, David Maslanka. Hmm. And as I'm thinking about this discussion that we're trying to have, is it that the music sounds like them or they just wrote some awesome music that sounds good? And we, uh, as part of our implicit bias, give gender or uh, nationality or like a skin color to music that we're hearing. But in, until we you know, see the title, we don't know what kind of person wrote it, and what does it really matter what they looked like if we enjoy what it sounds like? Absolutely, and I think this is just fantastic music. I, I love her music. So we're going to listen to uh, just a little bit of Pandora Undone from the Mythology Symphony by uh, Stacy Garrow. <laughs> That is so, it's an oral explosion, just like you said. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I picked that exact spot after you had said that. Um, what I'm hearing here, especially when I think about uh, composers like Jennifer Higdon, uh, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, living composers, uh, women that are gaining success quite recently, um, in the same way in other fields outside of music that you hear a person of color or a woman has to work twice or three times as hard to get recognized, I'm seeing this in the orchestral textures of the living female composers, that there's so much detail happening here. Even just in that opening, we have that kind of flute solo happening that's um, asymmetrical rhythmically, and there's all sorts of percussion happening in the background that's almost like musical ASMR. You can't tell what it is, but it's delightful. And then when it does explode, there's a million things going on uh, that are engineered in a, a very sutured kind of way. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what to say because you said it beautifully. It was great. So what has been your experience with this women have to try, try two, three times as hard as the men in the same field? Well, the first thing I would say is that um, fortunately, I'm glad to see that things are changing, which is fantastic. You know, the music business is like anything else. Uh, you hire your friends and you, uh, you 
<laughs> you tell people about your friends. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges is, is that, you know, in, in so many uh, historical models, you know, all the composers or all the conductors, they would all hang out together, right? And they would have, you know, these clubs, you know, lacis, you know, uh, all these different people. And so, you know, people would talk with each other and they would talk about these composers that they were hanging out with through word of mouth, right? And I think that now it's, it's kind of the same way. Um, uh, I think that women are, and people of color are beginning to come out more because there are more students in the colleges, in the universities. Um, there are more people who are working in the movie industry that are uh, finding that there are these great composers out there and I love this person's work. And so I'd love to uh, have you listen to this person for this movie or this uh, gaming uh, background music. And so I think a lot of it is, how it's always been. It's a very social networking situation. And fortunately, I think that today we are much better about, uh, you know, acknowledging our friends, you know, who, who um, are doing well and thriving. And, and I think that it goes true with the, the composers. Uh, so I think that today is great on that. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, for example, Samuel Coolridge Taylor and some of these uh, historical people, they really weren't part of that culture of, uh, of being in the group. Uh, so I think that that's the reason why they were not as well known. Well, as we sort of come to the denouement of this conversation, uh, how on like sort of conversely playing devil's advocate for a minute here, how do we encourage everybody in uh, challenging paradigms and appreciating new composers uh, without sort of having this social justice warrior reaction to people who are maybe using the current paradigm to their benefit? Uh, an example that comes to mind immediately is one of my favorite pianists, Yuja Wong, uh, is very much uh, criticized for wearing flamboyant and beautiful and a little overexposed sometimes dresses. Um, but if you close your eyes and just listen, she's a phenomenal pianist, but so many people can't get past the fact that she is, for lack of a better term, exploiting her femininity. You know, that's, that's such a great question. And, you know, I don't think there is an answer to that. You know, people are going to have they're gonna think what they're gonna think, right? And so I guess my, my belief is, is that I'm personally interested in the social justice part of music because I feel like that part needs a voice and I like being part of that voice. Um, and then some, part, some people just don't think that it's necessary and that's fine too. But my hope is, is that um, through people having an opinion and having that social justice voice, they will allow other people to have more examples of great music. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the fact that um, when we talk about composers, if it's a, a, a female composer, it's a female composer or a person of color or an Asian composer or a black composer. You know, I would love for there not to be the, the um, adjectives, you know, of describing, <laughs> the describing. One of the biggest trigger words or trigger terms for me in any field is, well, they're good for A. Right. Well, she's a good conductor for a woman, is nothing sets me off more. Uh, when I watch recordings of Symphony Tacoma, and I'm watching Sarah Ian Ianita's conducting, I don't think that's a great woman conductor. I think that is a great conductor. Absolutely. And I guess that's the thing is, uh, you know, the, uh, the music that I feel like I shared with you today, I feel like that music can, can go against anyone's music. I love the music. I think it's terrific. It doesn't matter that it is a person of color or a female composer. It's just plain great music. And so I that's just one of my things is that I, I want to bring all of this music to people so they can see that music is music. Well, and there's often this misconception. Yeah. It's from, and there are lots Sorry. of great uh, 
white 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 men who write great music you know it's not like i don't want to include them i just feel that you know for me my little portion of what i'm trying to do is is addressing this little problem over here that it's not really a problem but uh it's something that i want to address well and that's a misconception from people who uh are adverse to diversity in all its forms is that we're not trying to replace the gamut of repertoire we're trying to include more absolutely i think is the purpose that's exactly right so well it's said. replacing it's including well said well i think that pretty much brings our uh our time to an end here i'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording in a minute here and we can uh, continue to talk uh off tape uh but is there one of the things that I wanted out of this particular conversation is if you could say something to 12 year old Dr. Edwards to say it's possible, you can do it. Uh, if you keep your nose to the grindstone, you're going to be a big famous conductor doing great things. What did you need to hear that you wish someone had told you sooner? Hmm. I wish they would have said that the road is open if you want to take it. And that's what I would say. All right, perfect way to end this conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks.